Okay, if you could turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation and chapter 16. Uh, we're going to be looking at the seven last plagues. And as we look at this chapter, we can say without hesitation, it's a great chapter. Uh, the word great is emphasized several times. And uh, we'll observe that as we go through. But it begins this way. And I'm going to read the entire chapter, 21 verses. Uh, I feel like the it's important to read the whole thing because just the sheer magnitude of these judgments uh, need to grip our hearts and minds. So it begins this way. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the sea of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Again, God will bless this uh, reading of this very sobering portion of the word of God to us. So as we look at these seven last plagues, I want to just step back a little bit go to Revelation 11. And verse 15, because we've we've had this kind of fairly lengthy uh, interlude, uh, parenthetical section. And so we're, we're now packing, uh, picking up, as it were, the chronological sequence of the book. And so it's good to kind of go back to where we really left off. And so 1115, it says the seventh angel sounded. So this is the seventh trumpet. 
Okay. The seventh angel sounded. And of course, when he sounds that trumpet, it says there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. The four and 20 elders, which were before God in their seats, fell upon their faces, worship God, saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken up to thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. And the name and the time of the dead that they should be judged and thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings, voices, thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. So the sounding of the seventh trumpet then we saw the temple opened in heaven. And when we looked at chapter 15, we again were reminded of this temple opened in heaven. And out of it uh, come these seven angels. Verse 15, verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So basically, uh, the last of the series of trumpets is the herald of the coming of the king. He'll shortly come and claim his kingdom and assert his crown rights. This trumpet opens the seven vials or bowl judgments more, more correctly. And these will occur in swift sequence, bringing the great tribulation to a climax with the second advent of the Lord Jesus. We noticed that in chapter 11, it says the nations were angry. That's the word wrath. And thy wrath is come. And really, from now on, kind of wrath becomes the dominant theme. Uh, we saw it in chapter 15, verse 1. Uh, it says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels, having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Uh, we see it in 15, verse 7. One of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Uh, chapter 16, verse 1. I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways, pour out the vials of the wrath of God. 16, verse 19. And the great city was divided unto three parts, the cities of the nations, uh, fell great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And so what we can say is that this these final judgments, it's kind of the the wrath of God, the fullness of God's wrath against rebellious man is about to be poured out on the earth. And we saw again in chapter 15 uh, and verse 8, uh, the temple was filled with smoke uh, from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And so there's no possibility of intercession. There's no possibility of, of this sequence of events being uh, halted in any way. Uh, this Nothing can prevent this outpouring of the wrath of God. And what we're going to see was promised long ago uh, by the prophet Isaiah. And uh, we've actually, in our Q&A sessions, we've had this brought to our attention, but it's a very important scripture, Isaiah 13 and verse 11, uh, where we read this. It says, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I'll cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And of course, verse 12, I'll make man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the gold wedge of Ophir. And so certainly we we'll see this is about to be taking place. There's going to be tremendous carnage, tremendous death. Already the world population has been reduced by 50%. And by the time we get to the end of this, although we're not given a specific figure from the intensity of the judgments, uh, we know that man will become a rare commodity on the earth as a result of these judgments. 
So the bold, bold judgments are an integral part of this punishment on the wicked and set the stage for the return of Christ to the earth. They're the last plagues. In them is filled up the wrath of God. Now, maybe we should make one uh, observation that there's a lot of similarity between the seven trumpets and the seven bowl judgments. And some, therefore, have drawn the conclusion, based on the similarity, that these judgments are uh, concurrent. I mean, really, it's telling the same message three times over rather than consecutive. However, uh, we have taken the position uh, that they they are uh, they are they are consecutive, and so uh, we kind of saw this sequence of the uh, the seven seals out of when the seventh seal is open, out of it comes the seven trumpets. When the seven trumpet sounds, out of it comes the seven last plagues. And the reason we believe that is because of intensity. Uh, we 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 see the intensity constantly. The trumpets were one third of the world was affected. When we come to the bold judgments, it's much wider. The whole earth will be affected. And we'll point it out as we go through, uh, except for, for bold five, which has some limitation uh, because it's designed to affect the kingdom of the beast. But remember, the kingdom of the beast is also pretty worldwide. People from all uh, all walks of life will will have taken the mark and have have followed the beast. So even that is is significantly large uh, in its scope. And so uh, again, just to see that, look at chapter thirteen of Revelation uh, to see the extent of those that have followed the beast. It says in verse 7 of Revelation 13, it was given to him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and power was given him over all the kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So very clearly, uh, this is a, still a large <clears throat> quantity that are going to be affected. Also, the reason we see it as consecutive is because of chronological markers like statements like this these are the seven last plagues that seems pretty clear to me <clears throat> that these are are uh, consecutive rather than concurrent and so we'll point out that although there's great similarity with the trumpets there's also a, a, a much more significant intensity the other chronological marker is the chapter 16, verse 17, where we read this. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple in heaven from the throne saying, it is done. <laughs> That's a chronological marker, isn't it? Seven last plagues, it's done. And so again, I think we can see that we're really reaching the, the climax here of the tribulation period. Also, we want to point out the the fours and threes. We, we've seen that all the way through. Uh, when we saw the seal judgments, the first four, if you remember, were the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The last three uh, had nothing to do with horsemen. So there was a four and a three. When we looked at the trumpets, uh, the last three trumpets are also woe judgments, uh, woe, woe, woe is mentioned in these last three judgments. So again, there's a clear distinction. The first four are not said to be woe judgments. The last three are when it comes to the trumpet judgments. And what we're going to see here is that the first four judgments are just general in nature. They affect the whole world. But the final three, it's like God is going to hone in specifically on the throne of the beast, on the beast himself, on his kingdom. It's kind of very much directed to the beast, showing God is at war with the beast. So we'll point that out again as we go. So diving into the text, verse 1, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So this... Um, 
this word great. We, we said this is this is a great chapter, and I just want to point out how many times it's, it's used here. Uh, if you look, of course, it's mentioned here in verse 1. We see it again in verse 9. Men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God. Verse 14, they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth, of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Uh, verse 18, there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as would not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Verse 19, the great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the nation fell. Great Babylon came in remembrance before God. And then verse 21, there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, and again, verse uh, the end of the verse, it says, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And so, again, it's a word that speaks to us of intensity. Actually, it's the word mega in Greek. And so uh, these, these judgments, uh, we're going to say, uh, you know, you go to McDonald's and if you get a mega size, uh, it's big. <laughs> these judgments are big. They're significant. They're, they're great. And it talks about this voice, a great voice out of the temple. And again, we need to ask the question, who is this voice? Who is it? And I want to suggest to you that it's none other than the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, well, why would you say that? Because it's my conviction that all of the judgments in the book of Revelation are initiated by the Lamb. How do we know that? Look back to 6.1 and the seal judgments. And you notice, I saw, verse 1, when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunders, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And so he's the one that opens the seals. Chapter 8, verse 1, we'll notice. And when he had opened the seventh seal, who is the he? Well, verse 17, for the lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, is mentioned. It's it's Christ. Uh, he's the one that opens the seventh seal. He opened the first seal. He opens the seventh seal. And out of that, of course, comes the seven trumpet judgment. So he's the initiator of them. And now this great voice, and that great voice will be heard again, uh, crying out, it is done. It is finished. Verse 17, uh, again, it says... Uh, again, I missed the great there. There's another great. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And again, the world has heard that great voice once before say, it is done. If you remember in Calvary, when the Lord Jesus had finished that work, he cried out, didn't he? It is finished. It is done. And now, again, and that what was done? The wrath of God had been exhausted in the person of Christ in that judgment on Calvary. That three elves of darkness was all, it is done. And now the wrath of God is going to be poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. And once that seventh bowl is poured out, again, he will say, it is done. So I believe that that great voice out of the temple is none other than that great person of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus. And remember, all judgment has been committed unto the Son. That doesn't mean that he's just going to sit in judgment on men, but he is the one who is initiating all these judgments of the tribulation period. He is the initiator of them. It's interesting that the earthly temple at this point will have in it the abomination of desolation. But the heavenly temple, where this voice comes out, uh, this earthly temple initially was a pattern of the one in heaven. And so the, the heavenly temple at this point, as we've seen in chapter 15, verse 8, is filled with the smoke from the glory of God. It's marked by intense holiness in contrast to the earthly temple that is marked by intense wickedness. And divine judgment is proceeding from the temple as a result of the command of the voice 
of the Lord Jesus. And so here's the first of these bold judgments in verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial or bowl upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them that worshipped his image. Now, as we look at these plagues, we are going to interpret them literally. And the reason we're going to do that is because the plagues in Egypt, and of course, we're going to see there's quite a few parallels between the plagues in Egypt and the plagues here, that they were literal in nature as well. And so, again, we, we take the view that if the plain sense makes common sense, choose no other sense. We believe these to be literal. And it would seem that those that take the mark of the beast have some kind of outbreak uh, maybe a cancer in the skin, some suggest. Uh, it, it's restricted uh, to those who have identified with the beast. God making a distinction, just as he did in the plagues of Egypt. Remember, there was a distinction. Uh, you remember when it was dark over all the land of Egypt, but there was light in their dwellings, the children of Israel. He's making a distinction. Those that have identified with the beast, taken his mark, worshipped him, they are going to suffer. And we saw in chapter 14, the Lord had warned prior to this of the serious consequences of taking the mark of the beast. And so in chapter uh, 14, verse 9, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture unto the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. It was uh, God had already previously warned. There are serious consequences. You will feel the weight of the wrath of God. And here in chapter 16, they're beginning to feel the weight of it. It's amazing. Uh, perhaps many of them had done this out of pragmatism, uh, out of just, hey, I've got to survive. And how am I going to buy and sell? How am I going to run my business? Whatever. Uh, they they knew what they were doing. They know what it's connected with. It's this to do with the, uh, the, the worship uh, as well of the beast and his image. And so it's restricted to these that have done this. Remember the plague of boils in Egypt back in Exodus chapter 9 that fell upon uh, those, again, that were worshiping the gods of Egypt? Well, now again, uh, these people who had the mark of the beast worshiped his image. God has now put a mark on them. <laughs> and clearly, uh, this mark is that they have these grievous sores. Some have suggested that however this mark is administered, uh, perhaps with a laser beam or some radioactive ray used in branding them, has become a tool of judgment. The mark of the beast was the epitome of human wisdom and pragmatism. But God gives his verdict on it all. A loathsome saw. By the way, Remember, we, we kind of draw a little parallel when we said it is done and we kind of tied it with Calvary and it is finished. And I do think it's not stretching things at all to see some kind of connection to Calvary in these judgments. You see, these people who took the mark of the beast and worshipped his image and now bearing in their body the evidence of their sin. Well, if you remember on Calvary, the Lord Jesus bore in his own body on the tree our sin. They're bearing their own sin in a very real way in their body. Our Savior bore our sin in his own body on that tree. Oh, what a wonderful work he did for us. But they're now suffering as a result of the choice they made. And by the way, the awesome consequence of choice. You know, it's amazing. The choice that we made when we said, Lord Jesus, I need you to be my Savior. That choice is going to have consequences throughout all eternity. The choices these individuals are making have consequences throughout all eternity. Well, choices are so important. 
it's really important that we make the right choices. <laughs> choose Christ, choose life, choose him. And um, and so it leads us into the second bold judgment. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. And it became as the blood of dead men. And every soul died in the sea. Upon the sea, isn't it interesting? Uh, do you remember where the beast came from? Do you remember chapter 13 and verse 1, where it says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And so now the sea, the very place from which the beast that these people have, have taken his, his mark and worshipped his image, the very sea that he came out of is now the scene of a catastrophe of worldwide scope. Like the blood of a dead man, a congealing mass of stinking chemicals, repulsive and nauseating. What a contrast between those that got the victory over the beast and didn't take the mark and did not bow down to his image. Do you remember what we saw about them in chapter 15? They're standing on the glassy sea. <laughs> what a contrast between the glassy sea that they're standing on as they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb and the sea that the beast came out of. And again, we, we said that as you look at the trumpet judgments, if you look back to chapter 8, you'll notice that there'd been a foreshadowing of this greater judgment in Revelation 8, verse 8 and 9. The second angel sounded, it was it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. But notice again, it emphasizes a third part. But when we read in this bold judgment, we notice in verse 3, the third angel of chapter 16 poured out his vial upon the rip. Oh, sorry, uh, verse, verse 3. Second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Not a third, the whole. And so <laughs> this is a, a catastrophe which is worldwide in scope. Amazing to think of all marine life dead. Every living soul died in the sea. And, and you can imagine the impact of this. Uh, you can imagine it in many different levels. Um, first of all, uh, I, I remember once uh, m my wife and I, this was many years ago, we were living in Wisconsin at the time, and we were living very close to G Lake Michigan. And uh, Lake Michigan is is, is huge. It's, it's, it, we once got a ferry across. It took several hours. It's really a huge body of water. But we there are nice beaches there, and it was a sunny day, and we decided we'd go to the beach. But somehow we chose a day when a lot of sea uh, life fishes uh, had died and were washed up on the beach and the stench and all the flies and all the stuff like that. Uh, we stayed about 10 minutes and we were gone. <laughs> Imagine all this dead sea life washing up on the shores of the oceans. Your, your condo in uh, Florida or somewhere like that <laughs> uh, uh, on the beach, uh, it's not going to be pretty. Uh, thankfully, if you're a believer, you're not going to be around. Somebody else will be living in your condo anyway. But but you can imagine what this is going to be like. You can imagine the economic impact. How many of us love fish? <laughs> how many of us love shrimp, seafood? Uh, how much industry is based on this? What what economic impact this is going to have? Imagine the ecological disaster that this is going to be. And as you think about these things, again, right now, the world is worshiping the earth, right? They're worshiping the creation rather than the creator. This tree-hugging world, uh, you know, kind of earth-loving set 
are going to be absolutely mortified, devastated at this ecological disaster. And by the way, this is really important to see. The Lord Jesus is going to make everything beautiful again, right? It, it, it's not man that's going to fix this mess. It's going to get a lot worse. The ecological disaster is going to get worse and worse as we move into the tribulation period. And the whole point is this, the one who made it in the first place, the one who the world is rejecting, all things were made by him. <clears throat> Without him, <clears throat> excuse me, was nothing made that was made. And he is going to remake it <clears throat> when we see the millennial kingdom and make it with such incredible beauty. But right now, what, what a tremendous impact. And then it says, the third angel, verse 4, poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Again, kind of a foreshadowing, or, or if you like, Egypt was a foreshadowing of this event. Uh, we saw uh, back in the book of Exodus in chapter 7, uh, where God uh, strikes the Nile, as it were, through Moses and turns it into blood. And so we see the same thing, the contamination of fresh water, all water supplies turn to blood, complete contamination. In contrast to the partial one in chapter 8, and again, chapter 8, under the trumpet judgments, and verse 10 and 11, it says, The third angel sounded to their fellow great star from heaven, burning as it were as a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and of course... The, the uh, was very poisonous, the wormwood and all the rest of it. We don't need to go over the whole thing, but just to see the difference here, uh, this is upon the rivers and fountains of waters, not restricted to a third part, the whole. And they became blood. All the pollution of the fresh water supply on the earth, just like in the days of King Ahab, during the ministry of Elijah, fresh water will not be available. Not because of a drought, but because of this judgment on the waters. A cup of cold water would be a very precious commodity indeed at this time. And of course, it, it shows that when we looked at chapter 7, the saints that survived the tribulation period how much of a thrill it will be to their souls when the Lamb, verse 17 of, Re of chapter 7, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them to living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. By the way, this is also proof, I believe, this chapter 16, that the two witnesses ministered in the first half of the tribulation period. If you look back to chapter 11, verse 6, one of their uh, special God-given abilities tells us they ha these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Well, it would be redundant at this point in the second half of the tribulation period. But in the first half of the tribulation period, as these men prophesy, they are giving a warning. <laughs> and what a warning. The very fact that they're going to turn some of the waters into blood is a warning of that which is to come. And so I do believe that they ministered in the first half. When these judgments come, and what we believe is that as we look through this chronology, these last seven judgments occur very quickly at the end. And part of the reason we believe that is that time must be short before the return of the Lord Jesus, because with ecological disasters such as this, how will anybody survive for very long? Imagine that you take all the fresh water out of the equation. And so... Uh, very much we, we would say that this is towards the very end, uh, time is short. And again, what's the connection here with um, what has uh, uh, happened at Calvary? Well, several thoughts that come to mind as we are reminded of Calvary here. Uh, one thing, too, is that um, 
the Lord Jesus shed his precious blood on Calvary's cross. And the world largely has rejected this. And we're going to see that uh, they've shed the blood. Uh, we're going to see as we move into five verses five and six and seven, they shed the blood of saints and they shed his blood and they're paying a price for that. But also on Calvary's cross, remember one of the cries from the cross, he didn't just say it is finished. He also I cr cried out, I thirst. And here's the tragedy that men who could have come to the one who would offer them living water, they rejected it. They followed the beast. They, followed, they worshiped his image. And now uh, the possibility of having their thirst quenched is, is so limited. Uh, in fact, in eternity, remember the rich man? Remember just uh, all for a drop of water to cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in these flames. And so serious consequences of what they've done. And of course, we read in verse five, I heard the angel of the waters. And so we've got this idea of God's righteousness in these judgment. I heard the angel of the waters, verse five, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. In other words, this is a righteous judgment. Why is it a righteous judgment? For they, he says in verse six, have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. You see what he's saying? These people are bloodthirsty. And so I'm giving them what they want. They have wanted the blood of the saints. And you see it today in the world, don't you? The Chris, poor Christians in, in, in Pakistan recently, this very week, that have suffered at the hand of persecution. The Christians in India, uh, in, in various places that are suffering tremendously. And, and that's just to name a few. We could go to other places uh, where the Lord's people are suffering. They have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. It's interesting is that in Scripture we say, the Lord is worthy. He is worthy for worship and adoration, but they are worthy of the judgment that they are now receiving. Uh, it was uh, what they have done is is worthy to receive what they're getting. Uh, their acts have been so despicable. And notice as well, it says, I heard the angel of the waters. Uh, you go to your local water authority and ask them, do they know anything about the angel of the waters? And they'll just laugh at you. <laughs> they have no thought of this. Yeah, but I want to, again, just say this. We emphasized it last time. I want to emphasize it again, that God has a hidden administration of this world by these spirit beings. And we, we've seen uh, in Revelation, uh, not just here, these angel of the waters, but in chapter 7 and verse 1, we had angels connected with the four winds of heaven. Uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. So they're connected with the winds. And then chapter 14, verse 18, we have angels connected with fire. Another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire. And so, uh, again, it's just interesting to see that this world is is a much more spiritual place than the secular world will ever acknowledge, right? <laughs> We're living in a very spiritual world. And again, only faith can see it. We can The eyes of faith can see this, but the secular people are oblivious of this. But the end times, spiritual realities will become very clear. The spirit world, we're going to see later on, uh, these three demons that that gather the kings of the east. Uh, it's going to be, in a sense, the, the, it's like the, the, the veil is going to be brought back and you're going to see something of the, uh, the immensity of the spiritual world is going to be seen in a very clear way. Verse 6, it says, For they, uh, they've shed the blood of saints and prophets. Uh, they thirsted after blood, massacred the saints of God, and now their bloodthirstiness will be uh, satisfied in a very literal sense. Because they have shed the blood of the saints, thou hast given them blood to drink. And again, we are reminded of the Lord's words in Matthew 23. And we'll just take a moment to read them. Verse 34, uh, Matthew 23, verse 34, where we read this. 
it says, but let me see, I'm in 24, 23, verse 34, it says, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakiah, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. And so there's a very real sense. Payday is coming. All of the blood of the saints. Remember the prayer of the martyrs in Revelation 6. How long, O Lord, faithful and true? Well, now it's been answered. And these people are getting what they are truly worthy of. In verse 7, it said, I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Is this one of the martyred saints who was under the altar saying, uh, again, uh, in answer to their prayers, uh, Lord Almighty, true, righteous are thy judgments. They refuse the living water, and now they'll be given death to drink. While sinful men blaspheme the works of God, and of course we're going to see further on in the chapter, that the response to these judgments is men will blaspheme God, and yet the angelic beings, they acknowledge the justice of God. This angel of the waters, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged us thus. And he talks about the justice of God. The angels marvel at the justice of God in all of this. But sinful man, he responds by blaspheming God. The people of the world thought that the beast was almighty. But these plagues demonstrate that there's only one, Lord God Almighty. I heard another out of the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. He is the only one who is truly almighty. And so verse 8 and 9, it says, The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Isn't it interesting that the Lord Jesus, he was suspended between heaven and earth on that cruel cross in the heat of the midday sun. He knew the intensity of that. And now this Christ-rejecting world will know something of its intensity. What's normally taken for granted as a blessing, the warmth of the shining sun, now becomes a curse. More than simply an oppressive heat wave that weakens and withers people, this judgment will involve the blistering and charring of human flesh by the sun. He pours out his vial upon the sun, powers given to him to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Now, again, there's reminiscence of the trumpet judgments. If you look at chapter 8 and verse 12, the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten. Third part of the moon, third part of the stars, as the third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise. But the difference is this, that the fourth trumpet affected the sun. Uh, but what it did was it, it diminished the power of the sun. This judgment intensifies the power of the heat of the sun. And so it will cause tremendous scorching and burning. By the way, when when you're in intense heat, what do you most look forward to in intense heat? Where's a go-to place for comfort? Well, you love to go to the fridge and get a glass of cold water. 
don't you? When it's a blistering hot day. Now, maybe you've no idea what I'm talking about in Canada. I know it doesn't get very hot up there, but but we, we know what we're talking about down here. We, we've had 104 degree weather recently and, and you drink a lot of cold water just to cool you down. And, and not just that, a cold shower or a cool shower. But imagine you go to the faucet, you turn on the cold tap, what's going to come out of it? Blood. You turn on the shower, what's going to come out of it? Blood. Because all the fresh water has been turned to blood. And so there's no relief and no comfort in the intensity of this heat. And again, what is taking place has been prophesied. Uh, the Lord has said it in the Minor Prophets. We want to just take a minute to go to the book of Malachi, that last book of the Old Testament. And uh, that's the book that talks as, to us about the, the Son of Righteousness coming with healing in his wings. But before that healing in his wings appears, we read in verse 1 of chapter 4, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. And not just Malachi, but also back in the prophecy of Isaiah, in Isaiah's little apocalypse, again, the very things that are happening here, Revelation 16, have been predicted before in Scripture. Isaiah 24, verse 6, Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. So these predicted things now are about to be fulfilled by the Lord in these judgments that we know of as the bold judgments. But sadly, judgment has not produced repentance. Just like Pharaoh, how did he respond to the plagues of Egypt? Well, he hardened his heart, didn't he? The very same thing happens here. Look at verse 9. The men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Often we say things like, well, if people saw more miracles, they'd believe. Well, there were no more miracles done than when the Lord Jesus was on earth, <laughs> and they didn't believe. That people say, well, if if there was more evidence of judgment, you know, kind of God stepping in in judgment, then there would be repentance. And the, the simple thing is this. Those who are not won by grace will never be won. Only grace can win the heart of men. So it, it, what is it that brings us? It's the love of God that brings men to repentance. It's the grace of God. And if people are not won by grace, they won't be won. It's wishful thinking to think that if uh, these judgments of God were poured out, men would repent. No. Hardness of the human heart in the face of the most stringent evidence of divine discipline and judgment, and yet they continue to blaspheme. It's interesting that they're following their leader. Back in Revelation 13, when this beast uh, was revealed, we read in verse 5, it says, There was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And those that have followed him will continue to follow his example. And they, instead of bowing in worship to God and acknowledging in genuine repentance that he is almighty and righteous, they will continue to blaspheme him. So the final three bowls, fifth, sixth, and seventh, we said that there's a distinction. 
And the distinction is this, that the final three balls, God focuses his attention on the kingdom of the beast. It's going to come right kind of zoning in, as it were, to the kingdom of the beast. The first thing we're going to see is the kingdom of the beast is going to be darkened. Notice verses 10 and 11. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the sea of the beast, the seat of the beast, the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And so the kingdom of the beast, darkness. Bowl six, the power of the beast is disclosed. He's claimed, he stood in the temple of God and proclaimed himself to be God, right? And and so he's made this, I'm the true God. And yet when we look at verses 12 through 16, we're going to see that, no, it's just a big demonic deception. It says <clears throat> in verse 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beasts, and out of the mouth of false prophets. His power is not that of God. It's purely demonic, and the world will see it. And then the final fifth bowl, sorry, uh, the final seventh bowl, the capital of the beast will be destroyed. And we see this in verse 19. It says, the great city was divided into three parts, and that would be the religious capital of the beast. Remember, he sets up his image there. That's Jerusalem. The cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon the political capital of the beast came in remembrance before God to receive, as it were, the fierceness of his wrath. But before we look at those, it's time for us to wrap up this morning. We're going to leave the last three bowl judgments till our final session. But again, we're just reminded of this. There are serious, serious consequences to choices that men make. God takes men's choices seriously. And what a tragedy it is that, that men who refuse to choose life, refuse to come to the one who offers living water, oh, how they will suffer for their decision, how they will suffer their consequences. And then for those of us that have come <laughs> and we have taken and drunk of that living water or oh, we'll never be sorry for the choices that we made that there was a day in space-time history where i said lord i'm a sinner i need a savior thank you for sending your son the lord jesus but dying for a wretch like me we will never ever regret that glorious day that we trusted the lord jesus may god stir us with this sobering passage uh time is short it's time to be busy and get the message out. Amen.